Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for attending. My name is Tamea, and I'm a representative of the Biomedical Society at Manchester Metropolitan University. Today, we're joined by Dr. Jacob Glanville, Computational Immunoengineer, CEO and President of Centivax, and the co-founder of Distributed Bio, who will be presenting his work and research on universal vaccines. Over time, he's gained multiple awards, authored several research articles, invented the Centivax universal vaccine technology, and is currently engineering potent antibodies against COVID-19, thus en route to a potential therapeutic. Um, Dr. Glanfield has also been featured on Netflix on the Netflix series Pandemic, How to Prevent an Outbreak. Um, we'll be hosting a Q&A session at the end by answering some questions that have already been sent to us. Everyone is free to ask questions in the comment box below as well. And without further ado, I'll pass this on to Dr. Glanville. All right. Thank you, Samaya. And hello, Manchester. Um, I appreciate this chance to share my work with you. Uh, what I've tried to do is put together a, a set of slides that uh, on one hand are quite academic. I'm going to go into significant detail into some of the technologies we've developed. but based on some of the questions I received, I'm also having some slides and some commentary around the, the biotechnology and industrial and entrepreneurial aspects of how I built the company. I'm also going to tell the personal story of what it was like for me, um, my academic background, because those were some of the questions, how I got here, and then how we built the teams, how we move forward, and some of the, the challenges that we face on the interface between uh, hard science, uh, entrepreneurial, uh, endeavors to how to make things and make them accessible and then the the, the, the challenge in the confronted with with a pandemic this particular one and then uh, the panoply of annoying adversaries that we have faced since the beginning of time those are viruses and various other pathogens and some of the tools that we now have in the golden age of biotechnology to begin to address them and and beat back those waves hopefully forever I have a slide deck, so I'll pop that up. Um, I saw there were a number of questions, so I'll make sure that there's time at the end to uh, to go over those. So thanks for thanks for all for joining me, and uh, hopefully I have something in here for everyone. Give me one second. There's often a delay when I load the slides, and then we will kick off. All righty, so hopefully everyone can see my slides. <clears throat> what I've done here is I've tried to, given the audience that I'm talking to, to uh, paint a story for all of you that under, to understand how we focus on addressing pandemic pathogens uh, using antibodies and vaccines. And the uniting principle behind the four case studies I'm gonna share with you is the challenge of immunoengineering breath, which is to say, <clears throat> how do you understand why antibodies point where they point? How you, can you adjust and engineer them to recognize the most valuable epitopes, the sites on pathogens that are the Achilles heels, the most susceptible uh, sites with respect to neutralizing the pathogen and the most conserved sites with respect to enabling a good vaccination response or uh, a good antibody response to in inherently polymorphic pathogens that are mutating, and in some cases, those mutations can serve to uh, evade the immune system. I think there's a very topical aspect to this with respect to the coronavirus with the emerging strains, one that you're experiencing in the UK, the other one in South Africa, Japan, and so forth. Initially, and, and inevitably, there are going to be mutant strains, and I think of many of the questions I've received recently have been how much should we be worried about that with respect to our current vaccines, with respect to antibody therapies? Are we going to need to engineer new vaccines in the future? Uh, what can the ex exact molecular mutations tell us about what we can anticipate and what are the tools that we could apply if indeed we do need to create more broad spectrum vaccines in the future? If, is that necessary? So these are the, the stories. I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about an introduction and history of Centivax and, and my background. Then we're gonna go into those four case studies. The first one is going to be uh, an example of engineering breath against the HIV code proteins. This was a collaboration done with Stanford University. I'm then gonna jump into our antibody engineering efforts around SARS-CoV-2. This is a COVID-19 therapeutic. This is gonna involve a 
uh, an interesting interplay between which epitopes do you target, but also the kinds of other immunoengineering considerations uh, about the biology of, of, of antibodies as therapeutics. They do other things besides just bind to the virus. They recruit the immune system, and we need to ask ourselves, is this what we want? And I'm going to show you some engineering we've applied to address what we see as a deficiency of the, the current therapeutics that are out there. Uh, I'm going to tell another story um, about snake venom. And I'm, I'm going to do this for two reasons. One is that I love it. I think it's cool. And hopefully some of you think it's cool also. If, if you hate snakes, don't worry. I don't have any live photos of them. Um, but the, the reason I'm telling it is that it speaks to the same problem of recognizing uh, that are, there are certain conserved sites on polymorphic proteins. And if you can target those, these sensitive epitopes, then you can hit not just one uh, species, but you can hit many different species. So the same principle that is true in creating a broadly neutralizing antibody against HIV or influenza or, or the coronavirus, those same principles are also true in snake venom. And we're working to create a universal anti-venom targeting shared epitopes across the mutant forms of the neurotoxins and various other toxins in snake, snake venom. And so there's a synergy there, and, and I'll share that story. Um, finally, I'm going to discuss influenza vaccination, and in particular, our strategy towards trying to understand why is it that the immune system stubbornly seems to focus on non-conserved epitopes, as opposed to the conserved ones that we know are there and yet are usually missed. And uh, share with you some of the exciting updates that we have We're using our, our technological um, approach to tackle this, this deficiency, to teach the immune system or guide it towards recognizing the more valuable conserved epitopes, therefore realizing the dream of a universal vaccine, or at least a broad spectrum vaccine that can provide decades of protection against polymorphic viri, like influenza. Um, but I'll also talk about our programs that we're applying them towards HIV and towards the novel coronavirus. Um, at that point, we will uh, stop, and um, hopefully I've caused some questions, and uh, we can have a discussion around those questions. Um, so maybe I'll start with myself a little bit. So I'm a computational immunoengineer, and I, I guess at this point an entrepreneur. Um, my background was uh, I did an undergraduate at UC Berkeley. I was in the molecular and cell biology department with an emphasis in genomics, genetics, and development. Uh, I had some questions that come in about what are the most valuable things you can do when you're undergraduate and you're graduate. And I would say the most valuable thing for me was to work in laboratories. So I worked in two laboratories, uh, Glennis Thompson's HLA Population Genetics Laboratory. They analyze the immune polymorphism in human populations and how that interfaces with our ability to conduct HLA surveillance. This is the auditing system um, of when we are infected or we have cancers or various other pathologies. Uh, I also worked with Kim and Shalander's laboratory. She's the Berkeley phylogenomics group. That group focused on algorithms to analyze large sets of data to look at ver many versions of the same fold, the same conserved type of protein and infer from, from that phylogeny and that sequence alignment and the sets of selection pressures on individual structural conserved positions um, that teaches us about what is important from that particular, uh, those particular regions based on their, their resistance to change, therefore which sites are likely active and which sites are good targets for antibodies. Um, so if I were to suggest one thing, I would suggest uh, work with a lab. I think the, the classes are gonna, teach you things, the labs are going to make you do things. And in my mind, uh, active learning and applied learning is really a, addressing a more useful set of neurons that are going to cause you to remember what you're doing long term and to use the information in an active way, not just a set of things to remember for a test, but it's going to store it and you burn it into your brain as, uh, as active learning. And, and that allows you to ideate and create based on those principles. So I would really recommend working with laboratories. That was huge for me. After Berkeley, I uh, joined Pfizer and I worked there for four years. Um, and that's really when I began, if I go to the next slide, the, the application of high throughput genomic sequencing instruments, specifically pointing at the antibody and T cell receptor repertoire. So this was uh, a period of four years of, of really powerful growth for me. Again, it was this active learning where I was working in a group that was trying to make antibodies as therapies uh, against various different targets. Um, so Pfizer traditionally was a small molecule therapeutics company. Those are things like aspirin and Viagra and Lipitor and so forth. Um, these are chem chemicals that can be synthesized. Um, they have not been in the body before, so they could have unusual toxicities and they typically take a long time to produce. It could be a decade from conception to releasing a molecule to market. Uh, 
the body is, in contrast, is the envy of the entire pharmaceutical industry because our drug generation engine of choice are antibodies and T cells and these other adaptive immune functions that can uh, adapt a new medicine to be able to confront uh, pathogens that inherently uh, evolve faster than we do. You know, we may take 15 to, to 15 years plus to reach reproductive age, whereas these pathogens are evolving on a, you know, could be a 30, 30 minute cycle, a uh, generational cycle. And so what our bodies have done to confront that is we've created populations of cells that can mutate and adapt um, at a similar enough rate to be able to compete with these forces. And that means that we have this insane and remarkable drug generation engine inside of us. And the pharmaceutical industry has taken note and there has been a, a large wave in the development of biologics. So these are antibody therapeutics. And of course, this is the underlying basis of, of vaccinology and antivenom is based on antibodies as well. Uh, numerous uh, Nobel Prizes have been awarded for technologies such as hybridoma and phage display, as well as individual molecules such as the immune checkpoint inhibitors and so forth, to be able to uh, harness this drug generation engine and make medicines out of it so that we can um, take advantage of what nature has already gifted us. The challenge of these technologies, in my experience back in 2008 when I joined Pfizer, is that the repertoire, your immune system, produces hundreds of millions of different antibodies and, and a similar scale of T cell receptors and T cells. And so that it's just, there's so many of them that it was a bit of a black box. The system would work, it would pull out antibodies, but it also sometimes would fail. It wouldn't get the antibodies you wanted against the sites that you wanted. Um, that's a problem for a, a drug generation effort. If I'm trying to make an antibody against a, a certain location on a, on a drug target, uh, it's, it's annoying to try to get antibodies and find they're not getting against the right site. So why did our technologies fail? Um, and that was a problem that was really kind of a black box mystery on why it would be unsuccessful. And, and because we couldn't look deep into these repertoires, the problem was solved through brute force. It was just like, all right, let's immunize some more mice. Let's try a chicken. Let's, you know, let's try other types of repertoires because it was difficult to be able to look in and understand why do these systems sometimes fail? And of course, there's a more profound aspect to that question because that speaks to the heart of why do our influenza vaccines not produce broadly neutralizing antibodies when we receive them, even though the HA and the NA proteins from influenza have these conserved sites and they're found uh, in all the different strains. Our immune system prefers to recognize uh, non-conserved non sites as immunodominant. If we could answer that question, then we would have this profound ability to make broad spectrum or even universal vaccines. Similarly, these systems fail in autoimmune patients. They don't always do what we want in cancer and so forth. So that was sort of the, the stage that I was walking into. And I was a bit lucky that I showed up right around the time that these high throughput sequencing technologies that were designed to accelerate our ability to do genomic sequencing, an arms race as a consequence of the G Human Genome Project, and they'd reached the point that you could sequence a genome pretty quickly. And of course the question became, could we apply them to other areas? So what I was doing at the time was trying to make antibodies. And so I began applying these technologies, not to the 26,000 odd genes in our genome, but rather specifically to the 100 million plus unique spontaneously generated antibodies and T cell receptors. And, and the power of those technologies is we could finally open up that black box and look really deeply and understand the, the fundamental uh, mathematical dynamics of an antibody repertoire and understand therefore potentially why they are failing, why they're succeeding and build better repertoires in vitro or design better immunization strategies in vivo. So this is sort of how the, on the slide you're seeing how these technologies work. Um, if I were to take your blood and spin it down, many of you have probably done this exercise, you will isolate out plasma, the clear liquid that contains antibodies uh, in the top of that spin, and, and there are many assays you can run on that plasma because it contains those antibodies. So you can run ELISAs or other binding assays that can tell you, do you have neutralizing capacity against a virus or do you have reactivity against a given protein? The problem is that you're asking a question of a, of a mixture of many different antibodies and, it, and in, it's difficult to gain uh, molecular level insight into the successes and failures in, in that mix. So what I did with sequencing did, it's not a panacea, but it allowed us to go take the Buffy coat. So that's the white blood cells that get spun right above where the red blood cells are. And that fraction contains your B cells and your T cells. So we pop that puppy out and using some 
pretty simple uh, PCR amplification techniques. Uh, those have gotten more advanced, but in general, the, the idea is it's a PCR. You're taking advantage of the fact that the genome has done you a favor and the VDJ recombination process that shuffles up segments that form novel antibodies, that they cause the pieces to all come really close together in a region of about 400 bases. And that means that you can sequence them with these high throughput sequencing technologies. And when you do that, you learn a whole bunch of really cool things that were otherwise not available to you. You can begin tracing individual cells over time across the immune system and their affinity maturation. You can monitor clonal expansion to see which, how, ask simple questions like how many antibodies are being elicited after a vaccination. You can look at the affinity maturation process and adapt it. How do different adjuvants manipulate the amount of affinity maturation you're getting? What, do, what does boosting do on vaccinology and so forth? We can track class switching and we can begin asking questions about CDR convergence. These are fundamental questions just asking, if I already immunize two identical twins with the same vaccine, how many of the same antibodies do they produce? And the answer is like almost none. But what they do produce are similar antibodies, and you can begin to recognize those and, and learn something about what is sort of the preferred tactic that the immune system elects to be able to target certain epitopes. The list goes on. There's many exciting things. It doesn't solve everything. Looking at the sequence, the greatest weakness is that just by looking at a sequence, we don't know what it binds to. Um, but there are ways to be able to address that, and I'll talk about that in a, in a, couple, in a couple slides. But what it really did is it opened up this repertoire. And as soon as we looked in, it started giving me a bunch of ideas, and I'll show those on the slides, of ways that we could improve, that we could get better immune responses against vaccines, and that we could build better uh, in vitro antibody repertoires that would be able to more thoroughly saturate and bombard a unique antigen to be able to get those rare and exciting epitopes that we really want as therapeutics. So that was the work at Pfizer. Um, the Pfizer was pretty friendly about letting me publish quite a bit. So you can see the work that was developed there. I, I began applying the technology to a sort of blue collar, roll up your sleeve sort of solution of saying, okay, well now we understand the diversity dynamics. Uh, we understand some of the limitations of discovery antibody libraries. Can we make them better? And so I embarked on a set of additional antibody libraries that were, I used synthetic DNA generation to be able to produce combinatorial libraries designed on the sequence landscape selected by evolutionary forces, which is to say I use the amino acids that were found in humans at the positions they were in, in the frequencies that they are encountered in, in native antibodies, therefore taking advantage of the massive exercise of protein evolution that's conducted in every one of our bodies and making sure I wasn't building a bunch of antibodies that, that human bodies have already rejected as being like, no, don't build that. If you make that mutation, that antibody won't fold up well. And I had hundreds of millions of examples of that across tens of thousands of subjects. And so I could begin building better antibody libraries with less redundancy and less bad fitness antibodies. And that, that worked, that helped us produce uh, significant advances in the ability to make it make a bunch of antibodies against rare targets. So instead of getting like 20 or 30 or 50 hits back from an antibody library, we would start getting something more like 5,000. And that, as I'll show you, transformed our ability to, to go after challenging and rare targets and ask a series of kind of interesting questions about uh, to what extent do you need some weird antibody, like a chicken antibody or a, a, a llama antibody to go after a challenging target as opposed to just a bigger library. So that was the, the history of the work from Pfizer um, in 2012, I left Pfizer, and then I, I did two things. I, uh, in general, you'll, you'll notice my approach whenever trying to cross a river is I build multiple bridges, and that's just a technique where I think it's worth doing a little more work to be able to ensure success because you never know what's going to fail and what isn't. So in this case, what I did is I launched Distributed Bio in 2012 with two partners. Uh, and at the same time, I applied to the PhD program at Stanford for computational and systems immunology. And I figured one or the other would work, and then I would just do that. And they both worked out. So for the next five years, I just didn't sleep a lot. And I published 34 papers by the time I got my PhD. And at the same time, I grew my company. Um, and we ended up serving 76 different antibody discovery and optimization programs across over 50 pharmaceutical uh, and biotechnology partners, which is a lot just for perspective. That's a, that's a very large number of discovery programs um, for a company of my size. And that, that attracted the interest of uh, Charles River Laboratories. Now they have acquired uh, distributed bio in the end of 2012. And 
they're interested in pure contract research. So they basically want to continue serving all these different pharmaceutical and biotechnology partners where my real passion was that I had used these technologies I had produced in house to begin going after uh, an internal portfolio of things that I thought were really exciting, but challenging targets, things I wouldn't want to do for a partner because they're too risky. But I thought if they worked, they would uh, be transformative in terms of medicine. So I, I spun all those out and that's what Cinevax is. So it, now it is a therapeutics company. It contains our SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 therapeutic, our broad spectrum anti-venom, our in broad spectrum influenza vaccine, and then our nascent HIV influenza vaccine and COVID influenza vaccine therapeutics and vaccines, as well as a series of other things like antibodies against GPCRs and other hard targets that we were able to achieve with these technologies. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of these today, although I'm happy to answer questions if you're interested in like anti-peptide MHC binders or anti-idiotypes or some of these other others. What I'm going to focus on today is mostly the, the, the breath work, as I mentioned. But that's essentially the history of um, how, I, how I got here. One of the unique things about what I was able to do um, with, first off, I had great people around and great collaborations, but we were a little lucky that the when we launched in 2012, there were a whole bunch of people who wanted to do what, what we had just published on, um, which is use next generation sequencing instruments to begin uh, looking into their, their mice or their rabbits or looking in synthetic libraries or natural libraries or looking into patients with autoimmunity or, or vaccination or, or oncology cancer. Um, they had access to the instruments, those had been commoditized, but they didn't really have access to the analysis. Uh, antibody analysis is complicated because imagine you have 26,000 genes, but you have 100 million antibodies and they all look pretty similar. That means you need new types of algorithms to be able to analyze them efficiently. And so I was able to provide that and I was able to launch the company without ever taking on venture capital. And because I no longer needed to buy a bunch of, of hardware to uh, offer those algorithms, I could use the Amazon cloud, the world's biggest supercomputer, and it was available through my laptop. And so we were able to take on clients right away and grow based initially on the the software. Um, we licensed that out to you know Pfizer and Boehringer and Gelheim and Gilead and Teva and a bunch of companies, big companies, as well as a whole bunch of smaller biotechs. And then we used the data and the funds to then bootstrap uh, what we knew now about how the immune system works to make better antibodies, to build better antibody libraries. And that's what people came to us for to begin performing discovery against challenging targets. I'm showing you here, there's, I don't really need to go into it, but there's a whole bunch of exciting engineering that's been conducted by the entire industry to be able to adapt antibodies in a number of ways to fit specific bespoke purposes. I'm showing IVGs, which is the, the workhorse, but I'm also showing smaller fragments like FABs and single chain FEs the single domain DHHs. I'm showing you the conjugations of antibody drug conjugates where you can deliver an antibody that has like a toxic payload or genetic information attached by specific uh, T cell engagers that allow you to grab a T cell and then a target cell and they attack each other. There's by specific antibodies that, and then the CAR T technologies you may have heard of where you're adding in a, a small part of an antibody called a single chain FE to act as a surrogate receptor instead of uh, waiting for the, the, the native TCR peptide MHC complexes. So we work with all of these formats. Uh, I'm not really gonna talk about that much, although if you have questions, I'm happy to address it. And we worked on a whole bunch of challenging programs. So that's the history of where we got to where we got. Where I am now is Cinevax is still had taken on no, no venture and we have a therapeutic portfolio. Whether I'm able to continue that into the clinic is a separate question and I'm happy to address some of the, the challenges and considerations there, but we do have abundant support because I was able to incubate these inside of the company. We have support from the Gates Foundation, from the National Institute of Health, from the Army, from the Navy, from the United States and some other sources. And that's that's enabled us to push pretty far towards pushing the successes of these hard programs. Now, not every bridge I, I built across that river worked. We've definitely worked on hard things that have failed, but that's why we work on them. And then the power of being able to control engineering um, and have the freedom to ask these questions is I was able to take hard shots and, and accept that some of them were going to fail, but now we're left with the successes of some pretty exciting biology and therapeutic opportunities. So that's sort of the background. That's where I, where I came from. Let's shift gears now and I'll, I'll start telling some of the stories of some of these programs that I'm particularly excited about. Oh, I guess I have one more slide. So for those of you who are technologists and are interested, here's what it kind of feels like to do large scale antibody discovery. So traditionally, phage display, like I said, the libraries are sort of built in the dark. Um, you, what you do is you take a bunch of blood from a lot of people and you'd isolate out the, 
the DNA that encodes the variable domains, the heavy and the light, you'd stick them together uh, with a little bit of a, a linker. So they'd attach, and then you'd attach that onto a display system. This would be either viral particles, which is called phage display. It could be on the surface of yeast. It could be surface on mam mammalian cells, or it could also just be attached to a ribosome where you're attaching the actual protein to the DNA. These, these are called libraries. They, the purpose of a library is to attach the antibody that binds to something with the genetic instructions of that antibody. This is called phenotype genotype linkage. And it's important because of a technological deficiency. Uh, the technology the technological deficiency uh, is twofold. One is that antibodies can go bind something, but we don't have high throughput uh, read ability. We can't read protein directly at high throughput. We can only do that with DNA. And then DNA, we can do high throughput reading. We have lots of DNA sequencing technologies, but our technology, our ability to look at a sequence and know what it binds to does not yet exist sufficiently. That may be something that changes in the next 30 years based on some pretty exciting developments we've seen with uh, applying artificial intelligence and machine learning to folding. But at this point, we can't do that. And so what we have to do is attach the two. You attach the, the instructions so you can make more of that antibody to the antibody that can actually survive a, a selection or a binding experiment. And by doing that, that gives you the ability to build these immense libraries of billions or like we have our largest library is 76 billion antibodies. And then we can search through that to find binders, to fish them out. And then we can look at the sequence to make a never ending supply of that particular antibody. This is a remarkable technology. If you compare what antibodies can do, the antibody libraries compared to small molecule libraries, the, you can see the difference in why people have shifted over towards these kinds of technologies. Um, the largest small molecule libraries in the world are typically about half a million, sometimes a couple of million molecules. There are efforts to create these virtual libraries, but the real libraries are, are you know, e to the five, um, optimistically one e to the six, where in, in contrast, I can have an intern at my laboratory that could produce a 10 billion entity library and that they can do that in a couple of weeks. So there's just a massive ability to search more molecules and therefore more likely find what you like uh, in those libraries. And that, that's, that's actually how your body works as well. You do phenotype genotype linkage too. Your display system are B cells. The B cell genome has the instructions for making the supply of that antibody and on displayed on its surface is the actual antibody that is subject to selection pressures and binding. So you yourself are a display system and we are mimicking that in these technologies. So historically, the process for making those libraries was pretty simple. You just grab a bunch of people or other animals and you put their antibodies in, the antibody genetic instructions in the library and you hope that there's something good in there. And then the process was, was actually pretty primitive as well. It was, uh, it was similar to an ELISA, it was called panning. And what you'd do is you'd stick the target <clears throat> onto the, a plate or you'd suspend it with, on beads. And then you'd, you'd, you know, using kind of some hands at the bench, you would go um, wash off, you'd mix the library with the beads in the, in the, or the, the protein on the plate. And then you try to wash away all the non-binders. And this, is, this process is called panning, uh, like gold panning. Um, it's, it's time consuming and it can vary a lot based on, you know, a million little things you do at the bench that might be a little different. You have someone come in who's, you know, a little tardy that day, they're hungover, or they're just a different person has slightly different technique, and that can give rise to different sets of antibodies that pop out versus not. So for our efforts, I wanted to take advantage of the fact that I could look deeper, I could build a better library by understanding the deficiencies and build them better, but I also had these sequencing technologies to help me systematize, use robotics and automated processing to improve those protocols and speed them up to be able to enable us to do that scale of going after 76 different programs for partners as well as our internal our internal programs. So this is sort of what that process looks like. Um, it's, it's kind of like a cooking show. There's a series of these instruments and we kind of jump around between the instruments. The, the really big ones are in the beginning, you spend time um, evaluating your antigens to make sure that they're high quality. Uh, there's a general principle here, which is garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have a good antigen that's folded up properly, of course, you're not going to get useful antibodies against the sites that are relevant. We then go into panning, and there we, we hacked a magnetic bead manipulation robot called the Kingfisher Flex. And this allows us to pan 24 things in parallel and to do it in a very systematic way. Like it would, I wanted to optimize all of our protocols to get the best possible yields. And so I was able to run experiments with this robot that would be evil if I asked my employees to do it, which is like, hey, could you go run this, pro run this protocol, but could you do it like 15 times in a row 
and slightly change a whole bunch of different parameters and just do that for months. And I wasn't able to ask people to do that, but we could ask the robots to do that. And so we significantly advanced our panning protocols and we deep sequenced to understand the po of the billions of antibodies, what were the populations of thousands that were emerging and how did changing various conditions in the panning process improve our outputs. We then use uh, robots to pick colonies. So we pick you know thousands of colonies um, we use sequencing to rearray the unique ones. And then we go into these high throughput kinetics devices to do binding screening using Eacor or Octet HTX or the Cartera LSA platform. These are um, various instruments that let us quickly assess binding. We also have these instruments that let us look at cell binding. So these are fax assays at high throughput as well. Um, and, and that's basically the process. I can talk about that more if you care, but that's just sort of how you set up and, and what it feels like to operate in this kind of laboratory to run this, this process of rapid discovery against these antigens. A lot of the part that I'm not showing here, a lot of the thinking that goes into it is in the antigen engineering because we carefully sculpt our antigens with special tags and other bioengineering agents to be able to make sure we can capture them on beads, we can biotinylate them, we can clip them, we can capture them with his tags or FC fusions and so forth. Um, once you have the right antigens, then this process is extremely robust in producing thousands of hits against those targets. Okay, so that's the background technology. Let's jump into the fun. Um, this is a short one. I'm just gonna start uh, with the case of HIV. <clears throat> so like with influenza, HIV also is highly polymorphic. It's worse. So with influenza, we have to go remodel our vaccines on an annual basis. With HIV, because it mutates more rapidly, we've never succeeded in making a decent vaccine against HIV. It just changes too much so that there's no ability to anticipate what the one strain is that could be sort of the average of what's happening eight months from now so you can make a vaccine, that there's no such thing because there's just too much diversity. This has given rise to, uh, you know, initially a frustration that maybe it wouldn't be possible to make uh, an HIV vaccine. And that, that pessimism that was pervading the industry, it started to change around 2000, 2004, as a series of pretty exciting papers started popping up, first with influenza, then HIV, and now with a number of other viruses where people began to identify these broadly neutralizing antibodies. These were antibodies that could go bind a conserved site on, on the influenza coat protein, or in this case, the HIV coat protein, and that site was resistant to mutation. What was going on, first off, it was super exciting because it blew everyone's minds because it completely changed the paradigm. Instead of saying these things are mutant, therefore we cannot create a permanent solution, it said, no, there are these conserved sites. The virus can't change it because it may, if it mutates that site, the virus is no longer able to be infectious or it suffers a significant fitness disadvantage. And so there's a Achilles heel. And, and, and the second remarkable thing was that sometimes people made antibodies against those sites, which means it was possible. And there was nothing genetically unique about these individuals. It was just rare. And that flipped the whole story. Instead of saying, well, you know, let's just tear our hair and say, this is, we can, we can never make a universal vaccine or a working vaccine against HIV it asked the, the more exciting question, which was like, well, why aren't we all producing broad immunity? Why do our immune systems miss if these sites are present? Um, in the case of HIV, people analyzed those antibodies and they found that they typically tended to be extremely mutated. And so there was an argument that maybe you need a really weird antibody to be able to target those sites. That the, the reason we're missing it is because the, the starting repertoire in our bodies is not well suited to target those sites. There were additional studies looking at non-human antibodies, making an argument that maybe the virus had like found some way to evolve itself to uh, systematically avoid the totality of the nascent human repertoire, and therefore only these very absurd antibodies could be protected. I'm, what I'm going to show you today is I never believed that hypothesis. Um, and so I to address it, my alternative hypothesis was no, the reason those things look so mutated is because the virus is changing in the person and so it's forcing the antibody to keep changing. And by the time we harvest it out of the person, that antibody has been tortured and, and mutated heavily, but it's not an inherent necessity. And indeed it could not have been because they, they found an antibody against the target in the first place. Um, my argument was that there was something we were thinking incorrectly about why those sites were not immunodominant and I'll get to that. And second, that with a sufficiently large antibody library, we could prove that totally normal human antibodies could definitely bind broadly neutralizing sites. So that was the, the case study we went into here. This was with the Peter Kim Laboratory at Stanford University. And our objective was to try to see if we could identify a broadly neutralizing antibody against a conserved site on the HIV coat protein. So 
what I'm showing you there in the structure is this, it's part of this little helical, helical nonsense, looks a bit like my hair. Um, and there was a, a nice conserved region that was resistant to mutation because it would interfere with the ability of the, the virus to undergo uh, fusion. Um, and uh, Peter Kim reached out to me to say, hey, you know, we want to make an antibody against this. We're wondering if, we, if you can try your computationally optimized library to see if we can get hits. Now that we're getting 5,000 hits instead of 50, let's see if that changes the game. So we applied that platform I just described to you, and we took advantage of making uh, four different versions of the antigens, each from a significantly different strain of HIV. And when we did the panning rounds, we switched out the antigen between each round, therefore subselecting just for the antibodies that recognize the shared site and getting rid of all the other antibodies that recognize one strain but didn't recognize a shared shot across all strains. That narrowed us down from 5,000 hits down to about 50. Um, but we found them. We found right out of the library, we found very normal, nearly germline looking antibodies that in this case, there was one which was single digit nanomolar without us doing any affinity maturation work that hit all of the HIV strains and provided weak, but, but uh, real neutralization against the, the virus. That was exciting to us because it helped establish in our minds that the, our principle was correct. You just need a larger library and a mechanism to select for them. And that there isn't a, a fundamental bias from the human repertoire and an inability to target these sites. It suggested to us that there was something other going, something else going on and why we weren't targeting these sites. They were, immuno, they were not immunodominant for some other reason. And then from a practical perspective, this is huge because the problem with those super mutated, broadly neutralizing antibodies as therapeutics is that they're terrible to work with. They don't express particularly well. They're not very thermostable. They appear immunogenic, so you couldn't give them a long term to a person because the person would begin to produce antibodies against the very mutated surfaces on, on the drug. And this is showing us that we could make something which would be a much more effective therapeutic that would be able to be produced easily, manufactured conveniently, and non-immunogenic in subjects. And that was pretty exciting to us. So that's a first short and sweet case about producing broadly neutralizing antibodies against conserved epitopes. It was this study that caught the attention of the multiple different areas of the armed forces in the United States, the Navy and the, the Army and MIDRIP. These are groups that we work with now in the Department of Defense um, on a number of our other pathogen targeting programs. Because what we proved to them is that we could create these antibodies against these, these challenging epitopes. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit here about how we did it. So what I'm showing you on the left is the, the size of the B cell repertoire. So there is theoretically, if you look at the number of E genes, D genes, and J genes, you have about 51 heavy chain B genes, depending on your genotype, 27 D segments, and six J segments. And so when you have B cell decides to become a, a mature B cell, it shuffles up, it picks one of the B genes, one of the D genes, one of the J genes, shuffles them around, and it chops back, trims around the boundaries, and adds non-templated bases around the boundaries. And so all that shuffling creates a new receptor. And that process, if you calculated it, could have produced this like insanely large number. So everyone before high throughput sequencing was of the opinion that the theoretical diversity of the B cell receptor repertoire in excess of 10 to the 14 in the naive repertoire was so much bigger than the number of B cells in an adult, which is about 10 to the 11, that therefore our B cell receptor repertoire should be like totally unique, totally populated by unique rearrangements because each B cell would shuffle up and just by probability would create a unique B cell receptor. Um, that was uh, really wrong. Um, that was one of the consequences of the high throughput sequencing technologies when I looked into this back in 2009 as of other groups was the realization that when you actually look in someone's blood, you see way less unique receptors than people were anticipating. Um, I see more like 10 to the seven, maybe optimistically 10 to the eight unique receptors. And that told us that the naive B cell receptor repertoire, the B cells that, that are popping into your naive compartment before they target anything, they undergo something called homeostatic expansion. They make lots of copies of themselves. Basically B cells like, ah, that was such a pain to make a good rearrangement. Let me make a thousand copies of myself. So there's lots of me around in the body. Now, immunologists knew this, but somehow the word didn't get over to the, to the display people. And you can see there's a problem here because this means that the calculations were all really wrong when people built antibody libraries. Everyone was like, well, if we grab 50 people, then that's already so much diversity that we've covered our library. But actually, you had a huge number of redundant clones in that library 
that were limiting the size. So you, people could claim that they had this 10 to the 11 library, but you actually deep sequenced it and it would be 10 to the eight because of redundancy. The second layer of that redundancy is the memory compartment is even worse. I'm showing you there that I only see about you know, 150, 200,000 unique B cell receptors um, in the memory compartment. These are the cells that are CD27 positive that have activated against some sort of antigen and they proliferate when they do that. They make lots of copies of themselves and they mutate. And so there's a huge bias in your memory compartment towards customized but limited memory. And when I first presented this work, uh, people were confused and they said, well, Jake, how can you possibly have created enough immunity against your history of pathogen exposure in a couple hundred thousand clones? And the answer that evolved was that uh, your immune memory is bigger than that, but it doesn't live in your circulating blood. It goes and sits in your secondary lymphoid organ. So there's these chemotactic processes where your B cells go and a couple of weeks after a vaccination or immune event, they basically circulate and they go land in your lymph nodes, they land in your spleen, your bone marrow and so forth. And so drawing blood as people had done for phage display discovery was actually not a great place to look for the really interesting clones. Those ones are hiding. And because you can't just go drilling willy nilly through a person's through a person's body, we were missing most of the productive memory compartment. So this is very techy here, but our solution was to then therefore go, okay, now that we understand how much diversity is in a person's blood, we can go selectively harvest out different parts from the memory versus the, the naive from the different six loops, the CDRs that define an antibody, and we could combinatorially assemble them in a way, taking advantage of the true diversity mechanics inside of a person to build radically larger libraries. And that, that's, this was the basis of how I built these much better libraries. I used natural CDRs. I didn't, I actually abandoned synthesis. I wanted CDR selected by evolutionary forces, but I picked the mutated ones from memory compartment in H1, H2, L1, L2 loops. Uh, H3, I took just from the naive compartment that was two orders of magnitude more diverse and had a flatter clonal frequency distribution. And then in the L3, I, I created a mixture of the two. And that resulted in this radically larger library. And that's why we got these hits against these epitopes that people were missing. It's why we got 5,000 hits instead of 50. That was the underlying basis of the technology. And and the kind of that, like I said, the blue collar application of when you look at data, I would always ask yourself, okay, what does this mean? And what does this mean about the limitations of current technology? And does this data mean I can do something better? And in this case, the answer was yes. Um, so we applied that, like I said, to a whole bunch of interesting challenging targets. And, and we've been able to hit now, um, we have a CXCR5 antibody against GPCR. We have antibodies against ion channels with partners. Um, we have therapeutic antibodies for an anti-id program with a partner, HIV, and a number of other applications. Peptide MHC targeting where we can distinguish a single amino acid change. It, many of these cases, like with GPCRs, like with ion channels, like with HIV, it was so hard to hit these targets that people had come up with this theory of based on despair, essentially, that maybe human antibodies aren't good at targeting these systems. And that was just wrong. We, the same thing I showed you with HIV, we also showed with GPCRs. You can get a totally human antibody, not even that mutated, that be able to, able to recognize and neutralize the target, provided that you have enough uh, diversity. So you don't need a, a chicken or a llama or some crazy thing that's gonna cause you some problems as a treatment. Um, you just need a bigger library and ways to finish off the small successful. So that was a, a brute force success based on advancement of technology. And I give thanks to the people who built I think with sequencing instruments that allow me to perform this kind of analysis. Um, as you can see, this kind of analysis becomes very relevant towards the patients I'll discuss in total. So this is the history of our therapeutic. We started launching it in uh, the end of January 2020. We are going to the clinic supported by the US Navy in a couple months from now. Uh, it's been a long, frustrating time. This is to my industry, but uh, I did get one of those $500 checks to Instagram up, so we are still looking at that. Said, there's some things we've done with our, our antibody therapy that I think are going to get some long term advantages with respect to the presentation of new emergent strains and breathing therapy that can actually work in the hospitals. So, the interesting questions I want to ask here um, with regarding more engineering are twofold. First, uh, what we do here is trying to avoid the normal starting from scratch every time. We were in the middle of the pandemic or starting, and my feeling was it was going to become bad. So I wanted to skip the process of having to discover an antibody and then characterize the finding neutralizing binder and then have to go through the process of optimizing. I want to see, could we get all that? And could we go back to SARS 
and take anti SARS antibodies and adapt them to recognize SARS CoV. And that would be useful to save us some time, but also be a pretty powerful technique in the future because we don't really get new pandemics that are totally unknown virus. There are always, there are always mutant versions of things we've already been fighting with. We already know what attacked human, human populations. And so this technology would allow us to powerfully get on the shoulder of science and adapt existing molecules to, to meet these threats and do um, and then the, the second set of questions are some subtle questions around breath. The anti SARS epitope, how much are we limited being able to shift it over? How much does the epitope constrain the breath we're able to achieve? So um, let me back up a second. I'll say the big picture here is like, what, what, what sort of medicine are you right now? So we're a year into this pandemic. Um, it's a crisis because 20%, 10 to 20% of the people um, get very sick. And they require hospitalization, they can die without medicine, and they can have long recovery periods. So that, that means we need a couple different things. Certainly we need vaccines, but my feeling back in January a year ago was that vaccines alone aren't going to cut it. We also need therapies. So certainly we need vaccines. I'm really glad that we have them. I am concerned that not people are taking them. I trust how we might advocate to encourage you all to go vaccinated. With a couple of rare vaccines. Um, vaccines are important because they provide long immunity, they provide pollution level immunity, protect you from getting sick in the first place. They're already also pretty expensive, um, and I think that's I'm really glad that we have surprisingly effective vaccine and the, the, the multiple factors of producing one. So this virus is susceptible to vaccination, which is exciting. However, even with the vaccination, my feeling in January, and this could be true now, is that we weren't going to get rid of the problem. The virus is very precious, and at least in the United States, we have 30% of those that are not going to get vaccinated, and another 20% that are concerned. Uh, vaccines don't work 100%, although we have some vaccines that are 95% effective. Uh, and it wears off. So the other one is it's a big world, and we don't have equitable distribution of medicine. And in fact, if the virus costs anyone things that you can't treat one country at a time, it has to be a global success. Otherwise, it's going to keep circulating and be, becoming endemic. And then the final thing I was concerned about is escape mutations, uh, that the vaccine could become obsolete and require uh, non modifications. So for those reasons, I felt that we also needed a therapy. We needed a therapy of two types. One that needs something in the hospital so that it isn't so deadly. The whole reason everybody's at home because of 10% of people who get really sick and the proportion of them who die or the rest of the if they have a medicine that makes it less dangerous for them, the whole crisis is over. It's downgraded from a, a international medical crisis to a manageable infectious disease. Whoever likes the idea of a vaccine during this, and I love vaccines, I'll just warn you, vaccines usually do not eradicate the viruses they treat. They reduce them over time, they do a great job of that. But the way that they feel, uh, previous crises like HIV, tuberculosis, uh, multidrug resistant bacteria is these therapies. And so we do need a therapy. And then we have effective distributed therapies, then this becomes less scary and more manageable because a 90% effective therapy would downgrade this to about the lethality and influence on which case are likely to go on. Uh, and the third category, which I really think is important, is that we need a preventive for the newly infected. So something you take without having to go to hospital right when you found out you got sick. Or, or even before you were sick, you got a positive test result. Something Jake, I need to interrupt your me. presentation, brother. I'm going to pop out of here for just a second. <clears throat> Seems like we're having a little bit of technical issue. If you could go ahead and exit out of your slides and try to okay. reload them for me, that would be awesome. Hello to everybody that is watching. We're just going to take a quick second to fix some connection issues, and then we can get back to business here. Great. That's it. Um, where did it start? Where should I resume? Um, Samai, do you have a, a an idea of where we could restart a little bit beforehand? Let's see. And then Jake, it also looks like yeah, you might be lagging a little bit from your end. Um, we can make sure that there's no other tabs open on your side um, that could be slowing down your bandwidth. It looks like it's getting better now. Could you go ahead and say a couple of words for me? Okay, can you hear me okay? Can you okay. hear me okay? Yeah, you're coming through yeah, good. Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. Where, where did I get... the slide? 
where should I go back to? Let's see. Where should I go back to in my slides? Here, Sumaya, you have a night. Let's, we'll go back. Let me see when it started here. Um, I think it was about four minutes ago or something. Okay. Yeah, about two. Yeah, let's go back about two or three minutes. All right, everybody, it looks like everybody's commenting saying that everybody can hear now. What, uh, can someone tell me what was the last slide that they saw? Or All right. If you guys are in the comment section, could you guys go ahead and let us know um, about what slide um, Dr. Glanville was on before he started to lag? Yeah, what was the last, what was the last thing you guys heard me talk about? This will be perfect. We'll, we'll allow them to kind of comment in and they can let us know. Um, I think you're on slide nine. Okay. The eight and nine. okay, that's not too bad. Yep, everybody said slide nine, slide 10, slide nine. Cool. So perfect. All, All right. right, guys, I'm going to disappear back into the foreground or the background. All right, cool. Here we go. Thanks, folks. Um, I shall repeat myself on this section and I'll. Here, give me a second for my, my slides to load. All right. Um, Samaya, can you hear me okay? And can you see the slides? Um, yes, I can hear you. Boop, boop, boop. All right, excellent. Okay, so thanks, folks. Sorry for the, the glitchiness. Um, hopefully, my computer's doing a good job. So I think the purpose of this slide, I was just saying that we... The technologies I just showed you have enabled inroads against challenging epitopes in a whole bunch of different arenas. Um, it has also told us that we don't need inherently very mutated antibodies in order to target these things. We just need bigger libraries. And that's a big deal because it means you can make a very human looking conserved antibody as a, as a better therapeutic. It expresses better. You can manufacture it for cheaper. It's more thermostable. You can concentrate it for an injection and the person's body won't reject it over time. Um, the problem with a mutated antibody or a non-human antibody is that your body will detect that it's a foreign surface and then you will essentially eliminate it. It's called anti-drug antibody responses. And it's no good for uh, a long-term treatment. You need to be able to have something that is invisible to the immune system. And it looked like we were achieving that with these larger libraries. All right, so now the fun stuff. Let's go into case study number two. So this was now... January of 2020, the, the Netflix documentary had just come out the same week as China quarantined 57 million people. The week after that, I go to Washington, D.C. to the biothreats meeting where people meet annually to talk about emerging infectious diseases, dangerous pathogens, and the risk of dual use of bioterrorism. And as you can imagine, that, that, con that conference was uh, pretty wild. People were um, very excited and concerned. Uh, I rolled down there. I mean, it's crazy, right? It's a big packed conference, which seems inconceivable to me now, but I roll down there with my Starbucks and I see Fauci up presenting with a big, big slide of China saying that he thinks that this is no longer containable in China and this is likely to go pandemic. And that was January 2029, I believe. Uh, and that occurred to me suddenly that I was in a room full of people who'd flown in from all over the world who study this stuff and this virus might be in that room at that point. So I hastily retreated. Uh, I went up and created a plan for us to make an antibody therapy against the novel coronavirus. Um, I then presented that work to BARDA or to DARPA, um, and then we started working on it um, beginning at the, the end of January. So the approach that I'm going to describe to you is a, an approach to try to skip a lot of the engineering effort. So normally what happens when you make a new antibody is you... Uh, start the process from scratch, you discover a bunch of antibodies, you spend a bunch of time screening them to try to find useful binders. You then take the useful binder and you spend a bunch of time optimizing it to make it a better medicine. That's really time consuming. And my feeling was that we, we could potentially skip a whole bunch of that work if we could stand on the shoulder of giants and use antibodies from a previous but related virus and adapt them to the novel coronavirus. Now that's the fundamental engineering question was that could I use these anti-SARS antibodies that have been super well characterized against the SARS virus and modify them to target the novel coronavirus. That would be A, immediately applicable and useful for the, the current outbreak, but B, a pretty profound ability to harness previous 
discoveries from research labs around the world to confront new pandemics. We don't ever really get exposed to a radically new virus with a version that we've never seen before. The viruses that infect human populations are, are pretty well characterized. But pandemics are viruses that have modified sufficiently that there's no population immunity. Um, but the, the kinds of things, the flaviviruses, the phyloviruses, the lentiviruses, the influenza viruses, the new pandemic strains are versions of known things that have already been researched at this point. And so if you could adapt a known antibody that already has good neutralizing function, then that gives you a, a ability to rapidly reposition a new medicine to confront a new, new threat. And along the way, it addresses a fundamental theoretical question, which is to what extent are arbitrary epitopes capable of undergoing adaptation? How much does a certain site that an antibody bind to fundamentally limit its destiny uh, in the ability to adapt? Uh, and that's the story I'm gonna tell you now. So I wanna start by saying that, what sort of medicines do we think are needed? Um, we know that this is a global crisis because it's very infectious, but most people don't actually get that sick. The, there's 10 to 20% of people who get very sick. Those are the ones that need to go to hospitals, receive treatment. Those are the ones that we don't have good treatments for right now. Those are the ones that could die or have long recovery periods. So the, the reason I mention that is that I think it is critical that we have vaccines and we're very lucky to have them. But back in January uh, of a year ago, it was my estimate that vaccines were not actually going to solve this problem by itself. My concern was that it was going to become endemic, that we're gonna become escape variants, and then not, not enough people were going to take the vaccines or the vaccines weren't going to be efficacious enough that we would achieve global herd immunity. And keep in mind, in order to achieve herd, herd, global herd immunity and stamp this thing out, we need those vaccines to be everywhere. We need the majority, maybe 80% of people to agree to take them, which is definitely an open question. We need them to be very effective. Now they are. The, what I didn't know in January, I underestimated how effective the current vaccines are. Some of them are like 95% effective, which is great. But you still need to get it out everywhere. If you don't treat the whole world, the areas that are neglected are just going to reinfect the rest of us. And this thing is mutated. So vaccines are important. They're good. And I'm glad we paid attention to them. But my feeling was we also needed therapies. Uh, we needed two types of therapies. We needed something to treat people in hospitals. And we needed something to give to people early so they didn't get sick in the first place. And my thinking here was that it's really the problem that the medical crisis, the reason we're all wearing masks and the, and the world is isolated is because of the 10 to 20% of people that get quite sick and the unacceptably high rate of death that it overwhelms our hospital systems and a lot of people die. Once you have a medicine and you reduce that, then it is no longer a medical crisis. It is a manageable infectious disease. And my feeling was that that actually is a more likely scenario by which we restore society. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, but I think it is more likely that this thing remains endemic. And the minute you have a, a, an effective medicine, then being endemic isn't so scary anymore because getting sick, meaning you had a treatment, you're not so freaked out. This is actually how we've solved most uh, large endemic pathogens. So this is our, we didn't go create a vaccine to eliminate HIV, we created, an, we created antivirals. Similar with tuberculosis, we haven't stamped out tuberculosis, but we have medicines. Similar for a number of other pathogens that are no longer terrifying because we have medicines, which means that it's not so scary to get sick, which means the world goes back to normal. There are two types of medicines that were needed. One was a therapy for the seriously ill, and that's still really an open question that has not been addressed yet. Um, if you get really sick, they don't really have good stuff for you. The minute you have something that reduces it by 90%, the, the risk of death and complication, then you're back into sort of influenza uh, range of lethality. And that that is essentially, unfortunately, tolerated for, for normal human commerce and, and recreation. And the second, the third item was a preventative. The way we treat Ebola and the way we treat rabies is we don't wait till you're really sick. We give you the medicine as soon as possible. And what we know from antibody therapies is the earlier, and all antivirals, the earlier you can give them, the more effective they are. And so what I contemplated was a medicine that would be inexpensive, easily distributed without requiring an intravenous infusion. So something that's an injection <clears throat> and widely available. So that when someone gets sick, they say, I just want to get a shot. I don't want to risk getting more sick. I don't want to become a long hauler. I don't want to infect my friends and I don't want to die. So in my mind, these were the, these were the things that were needed. I felt that other groups had handled vaccines uh, better than we would. They were better positioned. They had the resources and they had frankly faster technologies. Um, so what I did is I focused on antibodies because I thought that's where we had a unique engineering advantage. 
Um, so maybe I'll just start by then why antibodies, right? Uh, of all various ways you can make a medicine to, to treat a novel pathogen. And the reason I chose antibodies, I work on them, but because I work on them, I know that antibodies have a remarkable history of successfully treating very scary pathogens. I've got a, a list here. These are things like Ebola and rabies. Um, with Ebola, you know, 50% of people die if you get Ebola. If you get the medicine in time, it's almost 90% of people that, that are okay. With rabies, like everybody dies if you don't get the antibody. Rabies is not a survivable disease. If you get the antibody, almost everybody lives. It's almost everybody. So it's like literally 100% practically efficacy. Similarly, there are antibodies for HIV and anthrax, hep C, diphtheria, RSV, C. diff, smallpox, a number of gnarly pathogens. Antibodies have been the drug of choice collected by evolutionary forces, and we can bottle it up and we can offer it, and it's been really effective. So it seemed like a natural place to go to be able to produce medicine quickly. And it seems to have worn out. Um, the small molecule reproduction therapy are not particularly effective. The antibody therapies do look like they are effective with the caveat that I'll mention in a second. Um, so the punchline is we were focusing on creating new solutions. One was an IV infusion, something that could work in the hospital, and as I'll talk about in a second, feeling based on the biology of the viruses that I wanted to get rid of inflammation or immunotoxicity based on the, the, the power. This is the estimate I had that the, that the antibodies would go in, they do the um, virus. Interrupt, Jacob, you're lagging again. Oh. But try. So if you try what you did before, if you try. Maybe I can get. Let me see if there's something else that's running my computer that's causing a problem. Sorry, folks. A couple things. Let's look at that out. Hello, <laughs> computer. All right. Uh, where did I? Uh, where did I? Where did you stopping at the room? It still seems to be lagging. Okay. So, um, and the presentation isn't up. And I'm still lagging. Yeah. 
That's annoying. I'm not sure what else I can do from this side. Shut down a bunch You're of other... <clears throat> Jake, I'm going to kick your um, share screen from the studio here. Okay. Um, and then if you just go through that share screen process again, give it a second once I kick the share screen from the studio or okay. stop share screen. Um, give it a second to kind of catch up a little bit and yeah, bandwidth should kind of reset. And once your speech is clear, we'll be able to bring the presentation back up. And then um, just for everybody that is tuning in, I believe that there is going to be a short um, Q&A at the end of this. We have some coll uh, questions collected from all of you. Um, so as we're kind of waiting for this to reboot, I will remind everybody of that. All right, Jay, go ahead and try to say a couple of things. Can you hear Yeah, we've still got a pretty good amount of lag. Let's see here. Am I coming through to you, Samaya, pretty clear? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you, but not um, Jacob. Okay. <clears throat> Jake, just one last thing just to kind of clear it. Um, do me a favor and go ahead and log out of the studio and log back in. Okay. And then that should be, we should be good there. Or you can just refresh the page. Perfect. This is the beauty of tech. Sorry, everyone. This it's is what's okay. to happen when everything, when we're all all over the world. That's the beautiful I, thing. I'm, I'm reading this in the comments, actually. And, and, you know, there's a couple of different people, like right here. You know, it's very interesting that we're all over the world. East Coast, West Coast, UK. See Mr. Glanville in here. I'll wait for happens to the best of us. Yes, it does. Very <laughs> much so. I feel like if you made it through 2020 with no technical issues, then you were a lucky person. <laughs> but, okay, I'm going to let Jake, he'll pop back in. I'm going to go ahead and disappear back into the background. Um, and when Jake pops back in, I'll make sure I get him back up on the screen and we can go from there. Sure. Um, everyone can put in the questions in the comments. In the meantime. Yes, that is true. So if you do have any additional questions or you have something that you um, want to put on Jake's radar, um, if you would like, whether you're watching it from YouTube or Facebook, um, you can comment and the comments will show up um, directly inside of our feed here. So go ahead, whether you're watching it on YouTube or Facebook, um, you can place questions in the comments um, and we'll be able to see them here on our end. And it looks like Jake is back, so I will go ahead and allow him to hop back in here. How's it going, folks? Can you hear me right now? All right, I think we're coming through. How's it going through now? There we go. Jake, you heard fine. I'm I'm here and you're good on my end. I don't know about Samaya or the, the guests here. Um it still sounds a little bit laggy for me. I'm not sure about everyone else. I'm going to disappear and do some things on my end. Um Jake, if you want to try to just bring up your share screen, we'll see if we can get things moving. Sure, it's finished. I've uh, shared the screen. I can't see the screen. How are we doing now? Um, yep, it's, it's come up. And is the lag that my voice is sort of delaying getting choppy, or is my lag that I'm talking about a slide that's different than the slide you're seeing? Um, I can hear you now. It was your audio that was lagging. Got it. So you're actually you're actually good now, Jake. Sometimes what happens is if you guys are running the slides or there's any other applications on your computer that may be stealing bandwidth, um, it looks like what was going on on your end is just kind of an overwhelming. So Got it. We'll, we'll let those. That's why I, I kind of went for that hard reset. So I'm going to pop out. It looks like the slides are back up. 
Um, everybody's commenting that we can hear you loud and clear. Um, All right, magic. All right. <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for sticking with us, folks. Let, let us uh, let us resume. So I'm going to go ahead and go back into full screen mode here. All right, and then Samaya, so where where did where could you hear me before it became useless? It was just where I interrupted you. It was just okay. a few so seconds. That. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so that what I was saying it was that the we wanted two what we call target product profiles. One was that we needed a medicine that would be effective in a hospital, so offered as an infusion. And my big concern was that we needed to address immunotoxicity, and I'll talk about that shortly. But for the second is I wanted something where I could engineer an antibody that could survive extremely high concentration so that we could put it into an injection. And that, that was really where I wanted the world to be, was I wanted to be able to have someone, instead of freaking out, just say, oh, you know, I just caught, I just caught a bit of COVID. It's a bit of a bother. I'll just go get my injection. I'm good to go. And so for that to be a reality, the medicine needed to work. But we also needed to be able to engineer and concentrate it at uh, over 200 megs per mil so that it, at an, a single injection or two injections could provide effective immunity and, and provide that in a convenient application outside of a hospital. What you don't want, which is where we are right now, is that the, the antibody therapies that are out are not effective in a hospital, and they are effective for people before they have to reach a hospital, but the doctors don't want to give them because in order to give them, you have to go, go into the hospital. You have to take away a medical staff uh, from, from more serious patients to go give an IV to someone who's not that sick yet. And so for that reason, because of triage, it's not being distributed to the effect uh, possible. And for that reason, we thought an injectable was going to be key. So here's how we did it. Um, starting at the end of January, what we did is we looked at the new mutant version, the, the, the novel coronavirus, and I compared it back to SARS. And what I'm showing you in these images, um, I'm zooming in on the coronavirus spike here on the bottom left, and I'm zooming into the spike. You can see these five antibodies in various shiny colors across the, the screen. The blue bit with the yellow, that's the coronavirus spike receptor binding domain. That's the, the sensitive part of the spike that goes and attaches to your ACE2 receptors, uh, tears open your membrane and injects the malicious genetic payload. Uh, the spots in yellow are spots that differ between SARS and SARS-CoV-2 and the spots in blue have not changed. And then what I found were, was first off that, that the receptor binding domain was 75% identical between the two viruses. So that's conserved enough that I figured we could get some antibodies to, to teach them to cross from from the old SARS to the new uh, COV1 to COV2. And what I did is I picked five antibodies that had been crystallized. Uh, so we knew exactly how they interacted with the old SARS. We knew that these things were neutralizing in three of the five cases that they were protective in mice against lethal challenge with the coronavirus. They came from a couple different sources. Two came from healthy humans. One came from an immunized mouse against SARS. And then two came from recovered SARS patients. And my strategy was, like I said before, it's building multiple bridges across that river. So we decided we were going to attempt all five because my feeling was I only needed one success to have a therapy to move forward with. So we took all five of these antibodies and we applied a, a combinatorial diversification strategy in the CDRs to explore billions of variants of those antibodies with the hope that some of those variants would be able to cross from SARS-CoV-1 to COV-2 while retaining the same epitope and therefore the same neutralizing and protective capacity. And moreover, we wanted to be greedy. We wanted to bioengineer, not just to adapt, but also to make these molecules extremely thermostable, uh, non-sticky, so they could, they could survive high concentrations into those injectables. Um, so this, just a little bit of a background, many of you already probably know this, but this is how the virus does, does its nasty thing and how the antibodies serve to neutralize it. The virus is surrounded by a set of these trivalent spikes. I'm zooming in on one, and the RBD, the receptor binding domain of the spikes, binds to our RACE2 receptor on our tissues. And it, that causes a restructuring of the spike, causes the memory to fuse, and it causes the genetic payload to be deployed. So neutralizing antibodies, either from the vaccines or uh, the ones that I've been engineering and other groups in engineering, there's a sort of meat and potato mechanism of activity, and that is the antibody that binds the spot on the RBD that needs to be still, and then the RBD can't bind anymore. So the particle is no longer infection. It gets eliminated 
uh, tissues rather than tissues where it can be a whole bunch of problems. So that, that's the mechanism. That green is the base of the body, the one that ultimately we post out of the slides. The best. Sorry to interrupt again. It's lagging again. Um, okay, so I guess what's our best strategy? Because I feel like we may be running out of an ability to run. I want to annoy our annoy my guests, and I'm concerned they may be able to hear me well at this point. What do we think we should do? Uh, my recommendation would be uh, if we had those slides, maybe you don't have them in full screen mode. We could switch. Popped out. So, so my what I would recommend is if we have the slides, he maybe doesn't put them in full screen mode, or we um, just go directly into the Q and A's to provide value. Um. Okay. Yeah, we can try both. If he comes back in. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm gonna pop out. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> we will just wait for him to get back on. And we'll try it without the presentation. Um, the live will be resumed in around three minutes. So if you get back on in three minutes, hopefully it should be fine. Thank you.
That looks beautiful. No pixels, nothing. Okay, great. I rebooted my internet. I can try avoiding going into um, full slide, like full screen, in case that's causing a problem. Um, it sounds really good to me. Okay. Am I live? Yeah, I'm live. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, folks. So we're coming up on the period where we wanted to transition to Q&A. So I'm going to give you a light tour through the rest of the slides. Um, and then that'll make some room. I, there are still a couple topic areas I'd like to discuss, but I'll give the slides a light pass, and I, hopefully that provokes some useful discussion. Um, so we were just discussing the mechanism of how antibodies block the receptor binding domain and therefore infectivity of the virus. That's how our antibody works. Um, if you're interested in the details of our engineering of how we engineer those, those five starting anti-SARS antibodies to hit SARS-CoV-2, um, we're going to have our studies uh, in preprint in the next uh, few weeks, and we'll happy to share that, and you can see that work. This is showing a summary that we were actually successful in all five cases to varying degrees of adapting these antibodies to bind to and neutralize the novel coronavirus. We focused on CENTIB9 as our favorite lead. This is highlighting a number of those mutations um, that we applied to the antibodies. And we learned a lot in the process about what does it take to adapt specificity from one virus to the next. And we've convinced ourselves that this is a generally effective technique that we could apply to other viral outbreaks. Uh, the antibodies bind the same location by bending studies before and after optimization, and they bind with quite high affinity. And in the process, we also thermostabilize the antibodies so that we can concentrate them. Those antibodies were sent out to five uh, partner laboratories that did neutralization studies. We sent out about 50 antibodies, many different versions of those five leads each. And the laboratories all essentially confirmed uh, the same rank order of the same antibodies that were the best, the medium, and, and not very good at neutralizing live virus as well as pseudovirion particles. Uh, we partnered with uh, National Labs in the United States, Stanford University, University of Kent, uh, near where you are, and then Sinobiological. This is showing that same data with the relative rank ordering that basically said that all these methods agreed that CENTIB9, E2, and F1 were our, were our favorite leads. Those antibodies then went to two national labs where we use hamsters as an infection model to show that the virus could be uh, effectively inhibited in both a therapeutic as well as a prophylactic setting. And in both cases, it provided extremely potent protection, 97% reduction in virus in the lungs within two days. Uh, and on this next slide, it showed a, a significant reduction in lung pathology, even after two days of treatment. The animals who received it prophylactically, they didn't show symptoms in the first place. So it basically entirely protected the onset of symptoms upon viral challenge. This is more data from those studies. In the interest of time, we'll skip through it. You'll see the, the preprint coming out pretty soon and I'm happy to discuss the work. But in essence, we basically were able to show this thing, these antibodies were able to cross to the new virus, they bind it with high affinity, they, they neutralize it in in vitro assays, and they provide in vivo protection, both a therapeutic and a prophylactic model in these hamsters. One of the challenges, as I mentioned, was that I was concerned about immunotoxicity. And indeed, both the Lilly and the Regeneron antibodies um, have failed in the hospital. They've succeeded. If you give them to people right when they get sick, it protects them from getting worse and requiring hospitalization. But if you give it to people who are already in a hospital, it seemed like it was doing more harm than good. And the underlying, my, my, my guess back in March, the reason we engineered our molecule to address this, and my hypothesis for what's going on in the hospital, is that when you get the virus early and you get a bunch of antibody, those antibodies go in, they neutralize the virus, but antibodies also inflame, they cause the immune system to secrete cytokines, they cause inflammation, they cause local, local attack of the tissues that they're binding to. And this virus sticks like burrs on a hike on your socks all over the tissues it's infected with. And that gives rise to a, a significant tissue attack and inflammation and cytokine release. That's okay early in the infection where that may be in your nose or your lungs, 
But that's a big problem if this virus, well, by the time you're in a hospital, is all over your lungs and it's gotten out. It's systemic. So it's it's on your heart tissue. It's in a bunch of organs. It's, it could be on your brain or your neurons. Uh, you don't want systemic tissue attack, inflammation, and cytokine release. So those are the things that kill the patients. And, and for that reason, we also engineered not just the FE region in orange of our antibody, but we also made two engineering decisions in the FC, the constant region. One is that we use a Genentech LALA mutation. This is a leucine alanine, leucine alanine mutation that removes the effector functions of the antibody, almost entirely eliminates them. That, that means that the antibody will go in and neutralize the virus, but it won't provoke all of these various immune responses. So that the it can go in and neutralize the virus without harassing the immune response. We think this is going to cause our antibody to be effective in hospitals to provide the good of neutralization without the bad of immunotoxicity. The second thing we did is we made a mutation from a partner that has that enables a no, more than doubling of the half-life of our antibody. So a single injection will give you eight to 10 weeks of coverage as opposed to three or four. These slides are just, this is just the receipts. They're showing that the antibodies are doing what we think that they're doing. They're binding the same way um, with these various mutations. This again is just the, the proof point that our mutations are causing the knockout of the various effector function. These are a series of receptors that bind the FC and those mutations get rid of all that binding. So it doesn't recruit all these immune responses and cause cytokine release and a whole bunch of havoc that you don't wanna have happening. More receipts, again, in the interest of time, I'll skip it. The purpose here is to show again, that the LALA mutations and the half-life extension mutations are both working independently. They're cooperating together on the molecule and we've demonstrated all of this. Again, in the interest of time, I won't go over this too much. This is just showing the, the final structure of our molecule, high expression, very high thermostability. We've got this thing over 200 megs per mil concentration. So that means we can give a really high dose in a syringe, which is where we want to be out of the hospital setting. And then it has that safety profile that we think is gonna be a breakthrough in the hospital setting. And so this is just the, in, the interplay between some engineering, which is very complicated, involves complex computational engineering uh, and the FE versus some of its rational decisions based on a knowledge of immunology and a prediction of the kinds of the responses that you want from these molecules. And we can just almost like Lego blocks. We can take these mutations in from literature, from previous research and for partners and apply them to get the kinds of outcomes we want. And that's really one of the powers of the antibody therapeutic platform. Uh, one last thing I'll just leave as a note, it is not inherent necessity that antibodies need to be bespoke and expensive. Um, I think that was one of the concerns people brought up. With antibody therapies, we wouldn't be able to distribute them in mass. Um, I reject that hypothesis. It's definitely possible to go produce very large numbers of doses and to be able to sell them for uh, not have to charge five or $8,000 a dose. That That is largely a consequence of historical precedent. That that's what people have charged for antibodies before. That's what you can get away with. Uh, that's what the insurance companies are willing to pay for. Uh, and many of the diseases that antibodies are produced for are cancers, where you might have, you know, say 21,000 cases in the United States, but you're going to make $100,000 or more on each patient. So you don't make a big batch and you charge a lot. Uh, this is a different model. We need a different solution. Uh, we have contacted almost 500 different potential manufacturing sites around the world. We've identified 30 or 40 that we like, and we're intending on setting up contracts with multiple sites in parallel so we can manufacture large numbers of doses. It costs uh, around $100 a dose to manufacture the drug. Um, you add in you know, business operations and, and distribution and all these other things, we still think it's possible to deliver the medicine. Uh, if governments support us, it could be $500 a dose. Without, it's probably going to be more like 1000 900 800 something like that. But a, a life-saving therapy for less than a cost of, of some iPhones. And that's, these are just a calculation of the set of the, the scale of the problem. It's a big problem, but it's not insurmountable. And these medicines, I think is, it's useful to begin thinking about how to mass produce less expensive antibody therapies, not just for the current, current coronavirus outbreak, but also because it transforms the way that we can use antibodies to treat a number of other problematic disease areas. All right, so in the interest of time, I have this cool story around anti-venom, but I think I'm gonna skip it because I, I know you all wanna hear about vaccines. So I will just say, this is the one slide. <laughs> the anti-venom story is that we found this guy who has spent 17 years self-immunizing with snake anti-venom from many different snakes from around the world. 
And in my mind, that gave rise to the possibility that he had selected for breath by repeat systematic administration. So I, I met him after 17 years of him doing this. We scoured his blood with our technologies and we found these remarkable antibodies in his blood that like a single antibody that recognizes all the neurotoxins from many different snake species. And that's exciting because it's fully human. Uh, it, it reduces the need for a huge number of antibodies or a huge number of anti antivenoms. You could have a single antivenom with a series of BNABs, broadly neutralizing antibodies against a series of the, the 10 major toxin groups that are found in all snakes. And then that could be a universal antivenom that could serve uh, all human populations. Um, I, I'd love to talk about this story. I think in the interest of time, I'm not gonna talk about it right now, um, but, but th that paper is gonna be coming out soon too. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump to the final story, which is about influenza. I, I do think I would like to talk about this a bit because it ties together everything I talked about. The, I'm building up the story of broadly neutralizing antibodies, these shared epitopes, and the holy grail here, which is how do you get a vaccine to convince your body, your living flesh, to produce broadly neutralizing antibodies. And then we'll shift to, to, talk, to question and answer. So the fundamental question here is why do we miss? I'm showing the hemagglutinin protein from influenza. The spots in black and dark are easily mutated from strain to strain. The spots in red are heavily resistant to mutation. So you can see there's one spot down here in the stem, which is ultra conserved but there are many other mutations sites elsewhere that are conserved here and there. And if you can make antibodies that recognize those conserved sites, you're protecting yourself against uh, many and potentially all influenza strains. The question of course is why do we miss? So I spent a decade trying to tackle this question. Um, one side from the antigen and the other side from the body, the, the repertoire. So the, the repertoire, as I mentioned, contains closer to E to the eight possible unique B cell receptors, less than people thought. Uh, when you get vaccinated with uh, an influenza vaccine and, and other vaccines, from deep sequencing studies, we see that they produce about a thousand unique B cell lineages in response. So not that many, way less than people thought. And then work from George Giorgio from the University of Austin using uh, mass spec showed that it was really only about 10% of those B cell lineages that actually convert to plasmablasts and start pumping out the antibodies that ultimately protect you. So in summary, you get a flu shot and you get about hundred antibodies and that's what protects you. So that, that's a useful number because then you can go ask the second question is like, all right, well, how many epitopes are there in influenza? You've got hundred epitopes, you're making hundred antibodies, maybe you're hitting them all. And the answer is no, not even close. So uh, what I did is I ran a large scale protein protein docking study of all known human antibodies, including ways to permute them over all possible epitopes. I wasn't looking for a correct epitope. I was asking, oh, what are all the possible ways that human-looking antibodies could dock against hemagglutinin? And we encountered millions of unique solutions, geometric solutions. And the problem is actually even worse than that because we know antibodies don't bind. All the positions that they bind to are not important for binding. It's a subset, maybe 12 or 14 residues that form the critical epitope where the other positions are free to change. And when you take that into account during a, basically a combinatorial subsampling, we ended up producing a database of billions of possible solutions of how of different antibodies could bind to hemagglutinin. And now that we have that database of billions and we have 100 years of evolutionary history of influenza, we can answer the simple but profound question is, what is the probability of a conserved or a universal epitope? What is the probability of a strain-specific epitope? And it gives rise to this kind of interesting answer that the vast majority of epitopes are strain specific just because vast of them have at least one position in their critical epitope that is readily changed from year to year. The ones that are universal are really a one in a million. So that's why we miss. It's just because they're always there. The epitopes are always there, but they're hidden in this ocean of, of variable alternative surfaces that could be bound to little critical epitopes. And even sort of pretty conserved, like universal with NH1 or H3 are really only a couple percent of your immune response. So if you get 100 antibodies, you throw them like darts against a dartboard, the dartboard is vast and the red bullseye is tiny. And so by odds, you might get a couple antibodies against H1 and H3 that are universal. But the problem is, let's say you have 100 antibodies, if the other 95 are against strain specific, and then the strain changes, even if you have those two that are broad, that suddenly is just 5% of your entire immune response. You've had a 95% reduction in your serology, therefore you're not good enough. You need a new shot. So that's the problem. It's a, it, we don't need to invoke any more complicated possible arguments. I'm not saying these other arguments are not true on the nature of immunodominance of non-conserved epitopes, but 
the math does not actually require to invoke them. It is sufficient to show that they are immensely outnumbered by the strain-specific epitopes. And so once, you, once we saw that, we thought, well, you know, maybe there's a solution here. And given time constraints, I'm going to go a little light here. So I'll tell you, I'm going to skip this. I'll go straight to this. So our strategy was as follows. OK, well, if most of the epitopes are strain-specific, then what if we were to pick 30 different strains and they were all quite different from each other. We picked them to be non-redundant. And then we co-administer them all at the same time into a pig. That, that's the animal study, animal we worked with. And, and But the trick was we co-administer them at a low dose on purpose, such that the dose of individual strains was too low to elicit an immune response. So those strain-specific epitopes would be ignored. But the combination across all 30 is such that shared epitopes would be up to 30-fold higher dose than the strain-specific epitopes. And therefore, we would be selectively rewarding B cells that recognize shared epitopes as a direct linear function of how many uh, strains contain them. So you're pushing the distribution towards the concerned epitopes. This is sort of the idea. You have an individual strain-specific B cell. It doesn't get enough antigen to activate, whereas a BNAB ends up recognizing everything or a large proportion, and so it selectively activates. That's the tech. Many combination, many components, low concentration. This was uh, some computational modeling we provided, where as we lowered the effective individual dose, we achieved in, uh, increasing breadth into the future past a, a cutoff of 2008, which is where we, we ran our simulation, assuming that we only had information from before then. So that got us pumped. That's what gave rise to the set of studies that you saw a little bit of in the Netflix documentary. And that's what's in the, if you go right now, you can see the preprint. It's up with Nature Biotech. And you could read the whole paper. This was work with uh, Sarah Ives, is my lead scientist on this, and this was this represents five years of research into this result. Here we're showing this is the proof. These are these are set of pigs that received either vehicle, so basically salt water and the adjuvant, and they don't respond to anything. If we give a single H1 or a single H3 at the 50 nanogram low dose, they don't respond to that H, that H1 or that H3 or anything else. But if you give those same two antigens at 50 nanograms, and you also dump in another 25 antigens also at 50 nanograms, then suddenly they respond not only to those two things, but also a bunch of other stuff, including things that weren't in that pool. So that was a mechanistic basis that we had identified that threshold. And when you fry this mixture, you get this super broad response. Over here on the right <clears throat> is showing a breadth against uh, a panel of influenzas that go back to 1918 from H1s, H3s, H5s, and so, and so forth. We're showing vehicle control in yellow. There's basically no reactivity. A bivalent basically produces hits against the H1 that was in the vaccine a couple years around it. Same idea for H3. And then you start seeing the C3, that's the concentration conservation uh, ensembles. Those uh, from high dose, medium dose, and low dose, we tried 500 nanograms, 100 nanograms, or 50 nanograms per antigen. We found that this increased breadth, and there was an inverse correlation of the amount that we diluted and the breadth that we achieved. And that would be anticipated based on our approach and our modeling. And this is indeed what we saw. This is live data from these pigs who received this. So we get this ultra broad response um, when, we, when we apply this method. This is summarizing that data from the previous slide. So. Vehicle control pigs don't really do much. Pigs that receive uh, <clears throat> a normal bivalent, they respond to the things in the bivalent in a couple years around it. And our pigs end up responding to basically a century of influenza, including all the, all the pandemic strains of the last century and a whole bunch in red that weren't in the vaccine. So this was a pretty exciting for us um, to show that this, this method seems to successfully communicate with the B cell repertoire to selectively reward B cells that recognize conserved epitopes. So we're not just finding a BNAB, we're shifting all 100 of the antibodies that pig's producing to all of them being BNAMs. This is some more mechanistic observations. I think in the interest of time, I will skip it, but we can go into more detail. What I want to show you is the, the real proof in the pudding is that other groups have tried creating universal vaccines. And I think where they get hung up is that often they show they can get broad reactivity, but they fail to get broad neutralization. And the difference here is that an antibody can bind weakly and it can be reactive, but it can it can bind weakly and but be insufficient high affinity in order to neutralize. It can also bind the wrong sites, and so it could bind and, and be reactive but not be neutralizing. So what we showed with our approach, we pretended it was 2008, so we only used variants from before 2008, and then we tested our vaccine against future variants and deep past variants. 
So a normal flu shot, this is now neutralization. This is the ability of the pig serum to neutralize virus. Um, the normal flu shot from 2007 neutralizes the 2007 strains. It gets a little bit of weak neutralization out to 2009, 2011, medium to weak, um, and then doesn't really hit anything on, on H1N1, so it fails to hit the pandemic shift strain. And then uh, it also begin, eventually escapes uh, H3 by 2014. In contrast, our pigs received, were able to neutralize a century of influenza. It's all the way back to 1934. The two strains here, um, we were able to neutralize. It was also able to future neutralize all the strains that we tested up to 2015. So that, that is pretty remarkable. It's showing that we're hitting an affinity maturing against conserved sites. And that's in, because we're hitting a bunch of conserved sites that haven't changed in the last century, the majority now of those B cells are, are able to neutralize new versions. That's so made it very impossible with this complex picket fence of BNABs for a new virus to be able to escape that robust immune response that we've elicited in those animals. So that's the basis of our technology. We're uh, supported by the Gates Foundation. We're running ferret studies and pig studies with live challenge to go into the pig veterinary market and then into the human uh, universal vaccine market. Our same technologies we are now piloting on HIV and we are now applying them to the coronavirus with initial, first off, I'm hoping I don't ever need to use it, um, but we are producing a broad spectrum anti-coronavirus vaccine and our first target is the mink and mink market, um, but we would escalate it from veterinary to human if that was necessary. I'll just say for a minute, the reason we focused on pigs is that first off, it's a $180 million market for flu shots for pigs. So there's a market there and, and a farmer cares about his pig. Nobody cares about a mouse. So I always try to work on an animal model that it matters because then you're forced to actually make a medicine that works. I also think there's a value in working towards the veterinary market on the way towards the human market as quickly as possible because it is immensely powerful validation and it gives you resources earlier on. So you're less stuck in this, this evil scenario of a burn rate where you're making no money and you're spending a long time trying to develop something. A lot of dr good drugs have petered out because of that. And I think if you can get into veterinary space, on the escalation to human, you've proven your drug remarkably well, you've produced a medicine that worked by aligning incentives, and you've got resources earlier. The other advantage is that pigs spread coronavirus, or sorry, influenza, they are, influenza, sorry. They are the uh, primary zoonotic uh, recombination species that causes avian flus, pig flus, and human flus to shuffle up and to create the new outbreak flus that are quite different looking and then that are the basis of a pandemic. So if you can, wipe out influenzas in pigs, you're pushing the whole influenza problem further away from humans. If you can start treating the humans, then we could contemplate a post-influenza society. And to wrap up, I'll just say there are a number of other pathogens that use polymorphism and, and rapid antigenic variation as a mechanism to avoid the immune response. And so we are starting, like I mentioned, with HIV and the coronavirus to apply this technology in a number of other areas. You'll notice the attractive thing about it is we don't need to do any weird engineering on the antigens. Uh, we just need to provide a panoply of them that are all diverse from each other and provide them at a low concentration. And that's exciting because that means that's something we could apply in a number of different scenarios. And that's some of the work that we'll be doing going forward. All right, I think I'll just wrap up by acknowledging the mixture of our team members here in the United States, our collaborators in Guatemala, um, our team members um, at Centivax and then my team at Distributed Bio that helped us incubate these technologies. Um, at that point, I'd like to stop and I, I understand there's a series of questions and I will be happy to answer them. Um, thank you. Um, due to the time crunch, we're gonna kind of filter down the questions and just do the main ones. So some of the ones that have been put in the comments and some of the ones that we received um, earlier on today. Um, First one is, do you expect that diseases like COVID will become more common within our lifetime? Yeah, so unfortunately, yes, I do. This is uh, this is the first time I, second time I met Bill Gates and the first time I spent time talking with him. Um, that was the reason I was invited, was that we, we believe he was gathering a group to be able to address the combination of human and zoonotic infectious disease globally. We have more people on the planet than we've ever had before, and we travel more than we ever had before. And then finally, we have these large mega farms. And the way viruses work is that the more infections you have, the more opportunities they have to mutate and therefore to adapt. Uh, and particularly in the case of influenza and the pigs, um, you have these mega farms that have 100,000 animals. These are in China and the United States. There are other countries that have large farms, and they often are co-located 
are accessible to to birds, which are a, a host reservoir of wild avian influenzas. And that, if you just have that much body mass and they're all close to each other, then you have the terrifying ability to massively propagate uh, strains of, of pig, of human, and of avian influenzas, and they have the ability to shuffle inside the organism. It's kind of like building a bigger library. Like if I were to design any system to try to maximize the chance of creating a new pandemic, that's how I do it. I go, let's get as many animals as possible. Let's put them all really close together and let's make sure that they can be exposed to humans and birds and themselves. And that's how you can make new pandemic. The same principle is true in those mink farms. That's why the Danish freaked out because the minks were making mutations to further adapt and modify uh, a human a human infectious coronavirus so that is a risk for us now and because of our travel you saw how quickly this coronavirus reached around the entire world uh, we are more susceptible to these kinds of viruses we're also digging deeper into forests and hidden areas and and, and people can get out so luckily i think we did we got lucky that people did a remarkable job in africa a bunch of heroes to protect the rest of us from being more exposed to ebola than we were um, and that's been contained. But as we go forward, we're going to get less lucky sometimes. So it is incumbent upon us to not just fight this this pathogen now, not be myopic, but to look uh, look to the horizon to create broadly neutralizing antibodies and universal vaccines, and to to be dedicated to forget to to win the forever war against these pathogens. I think that's also possible. By the way, I don't want to give a pessimistic scenario. I think we have the technologies at our disposal now to create a post pathogen humanity or a less pathogenically burdened humanity to eradicate, as we have done successfully now, with with uh, eradicate or nearly eradicated a number of pathogens. It is possible for us to do that. We just need to apply the technologies we have now and to be dedicated to accomplish that. So there's a space for our children and every generation thereafter that has less less pathogens forever. And we, we could accomplish that, but we need to work on it. Mm -hmm. So um, the next question is to do with anti-vaxxers. Um, what's your experience with anti-vaxxers? Do you think pro-vax people do enough to convert anti-vax people? And what should we do to help promote vaccine use? Sure. So I think there's a couple categories, really, of, of people. And I think we should think about and respect the nuance. So um, there are definitely, you know, there's there's some crazies out there. And you're never, I don't know if I'm going to ever convince them. But but I think grouped into them potentially unfairly is a large population of people who have, uh, you know, some distrust for some good reasons of the pharmaceutical industry or, you know, of agencies asking them to go take medicines and they don't understand them. They have not been communicated to them effectively. There's been a failure, in my opinion, of the World Health Organization and the CDC to provide effective communication. Um, and, and I think they're concerned about new medicines. And, and I think that's actually a reasonable thing. And I think they should their concerns should be respected with real data and real communication. So I grew up with a bunch of hippies on a lake in Guatemala. So I, I, I'm familiar with how some of these communities think. And my approach is to try to just be open and, and honest. I think the other challenge that we have is that policymakers and epidemiologists, they, they know that you're supposed to just give the simplest possible answer because people find complexity confusing. But I think they're disrespecting their audiences by doing that too much, by just saying, no, everyone get vaccinated, don't ask questions. And maybe they're exasperated. Maybe they think that's going to give rise to uh, increased increased uptake. But I, I think it also gives rise to increased distrust. And I, I think we should do a better job of communicating accurately. I think instead of saying, no, they're safe, I think you just got to be honest and say, no, look, these, these medicines in general look quite safe so far. There are some cases of anaphylaxis that have happened afterwards. We are monitoring a couple cases of Bell's policy to make sure that they're not related. They're very rare. If you think about the risk of driving a car versus this, it's low. But if you have a strong autoimmune disease where you have flare-ups like multiple sclerosis after a vaccine, some people have experienced that, you should talk to your rheumatologist. Um, uh, if you if you carry an EpiPen, you should go um, have that conversation. And we should also just be straightforward. We go, no, look, uh, it's not the case that vaccines are always 100% safe. There have been some cases of people having uh, autoimmune autoimmune responses after vaccines. It's rare, but it's not unheard of. And I think we should acknowledge that and just say, look, in the history of vaccines, here's how safe they've been so far. Here are the cases of, that there's been an issue. I think you should balance that against the known danger of coronavirus, which definitely is a problem. And in my opinion, is much higher risk because it's a known risk as opposed to this very low risk of a long-term consequence that may happen. I, I think that communication, I think, inspires trust and it makes it easier for people to accept. The other thing that's going to help is a bunch of us are going to get vaccinated and we're going to be okay. 
And so there's going to be a little bit of FOMO where people who are vaccine hesitant are going to be like, well, I don't know. I kind of, I want to be protected. It seems like all my buddies have taken it. They all seem fine. And I think that'll help. I think what fights against us is the internet. Um, I used to believe that when the internet first came online, I was like, oh, this is amazing. Now everyone's going to have the same set of information. There's going to be no more ridiculous arguments anymore. And I've never been so wrong because what the internet has done, it has not created a single universal place of shared truth. What it has done is it has allowed a, curly, a curdling and coalescing of people to be able to hear voices that agree with them. And so people go find a bubble of, of misinformation or information, and then that makes them think that they're right and they're less likely to, to and there's misinformation. I, and I think the way that that gets handled is by a uh, genuine effort of highly credible uh, institutions who can distribute nuanced and but correct information so that people can trust it. And I, I think that's an effort that I'm, I'm frankly uh, extremely underwhelmed with how well that's been done in 2020 and I'm hoping to see better in 2021. And that, that requires funding. I think that requires multiple nations to come together to prop up uh, the CDC, the, the World Health Organization and, 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 national, and each nation should do this as well and have a body of experts who can go put information together, share it effectively, and, and flip the script where we now can now use the internet and, and these information distribution channels to our advantage to provide people what they are hungry for, which is accurate information so they can make good choices for their families and they feel like they're, they're being told the whole story. And I think that's really how we can help, that we as scientists and institutions of science need to do a better job of outreach and be able to like basically have the respect for the human the population at large to give them the whole story and give it evenly and fairly. And I think if they see that, most of them will say, you know what, I think this is reasonable. I think I'll go get vaccinated. Um, yep, I agree with all of that. Um, I think the anti-vax movement is more of a thing in America than it is in the UK, but I guess they're still, they're still everywhere and we, we've got to work on that. Um, the next question is, if half the world gets vaccinated, how long will it take for the rest of the population to reinfect them? Interesting. Okay, so if half the world gets vaccinated, we're not going to achieve herd immunity. There's this calculation, this, um, there's a technique called r naught calculation, which is you try to estimate um, how many people will get infected for each person infected. So an r naught of three means that that person would infect three new people. There's a whole bunch of problems, and in general, actually, I, I hate the R naught thing. I think it's a it's a terrible instrument um, because it doesn't take into account time, or and it, it's also not a universal property like physics. It, it totally depends on policies uh, and practices and, and medical nuance. But that said, the average R naught here and and more sophisticated calculation instruments will show that we need something in the order of 70 to 80% of the population immune in order for this to begin to wind down and go away. I don't think that's gonna happen. So if, if I'm wrong, I'd be very happy. 50% certainly isn't that. So 50% of people vaccinated, uh, that's less than 50% of people therefore that are immune because the vaccine's not 100% effective. What that'll put you into a position of, if you imagine that simulation in your head, is that those people will now have immunity. Now, we don't know how long for exactly. I think we can we can assume longer than a year and maybe they have two years, but eventually it will degrade and they'll need booster shots. The remaining 50% of people are going to be subject to um, essentially herd immunity infection, which is they're gonna get infected and they will have immunity. It looks like that immunity does last at least seven, eight months and ticking. So I'm gonna guess it lasts over a year. Um, but that's a terrifying scenario if you need to go infect three and a half billion people to establish herd immunity. That's, that's going to be a catastrophic loss of human life and dysfunction of our hospital systems and then side effect death of people for all the other reasons you might want to go to a hospital and now you're scared to go because of coronavirus. Uh, and then that also will wear off. And because there's enough people and because of inefficient mixing, you could give rise to this sort of like ebb and flow of infections, but you'd have a, a classic endemic problem. So that, that's why we should achieve higher than 50% vaccination. Um, we will benefit from the herd, natural herd immunity, but we should not rely on it because the, the cost of human life is too high at this point. Um, and that's frankly where we are. That's going to be the open question of 2021 is can we convince enough of our friends and neighbors and loved ones to go get vaccinated to insulate our communities and to help stamp this thing out uh, throughout the world? So we, I think it's still possible. I just, I'm concerned it's challenging. Um, the next question I think is related to something you've mentioned before. Say someone contracts a virus and gets them on a clonal therapy, will that patient still develop the normal memory type immunization along with having the monoclonals in with them? That's an awesome question. So 
It depends a little bit on timing and partially I don't know. So we do know with like rabies, they give you the monoclonal and, or a polyclonal and then they also give you a rabies vaccine. They give both at once and that seems to work. But that said, it's kind of hard to study rabies because there aren't a huge number of cases. Um, with respect to uh, monoclonals here, we don't know, really know the answer yet. Here's what I can expect as an immunologist. I would anticipate that by the time you give a monoclonal to someone who's already showing symptoms, at that point, the virus has already been propagating in their body and they're already starting to mount T cell and, and, and stimulate B cell immune responses against the pathogen. So my feeling is it depends a little bit how early you, you apply the quench, you apply the antibody. Once the antibody goes in, it's going to coat all of the the virus, and then you have an open, and at that point, you have the virus is now being targeted for degradation and so forth. So it will continue to be presented, and you'll continue to have some immune response, and you're going to have a bunch of tissues that are still infected. So my suspicion is that that person will develop natural immunity as well, uh, and so they will benefit from both. But I think that's an open question that needs to be looked at. Is it the case that applying an antibody therapy reduces the the long term natural immunity? Um, in the absence of knowledge, I would recommend that if you got an antibody therapy when you were sick. Uh, you should go get vaccinated to be sure. Um, we've had a question coming in the comments. So with the data you have, do you have algorithmic ability to predict pathogenic virus neutralization? And if so, to what degree? Could you repeat the question? Um, with the data you have, do you have algorithmic ability to predict pathogenic virus neutralization and if so, to what degree? Interesting, okay. So I guess with the data we have, we, we don't need algorithms. We use, my general feeling is algorithms are good to set up your probability of searching big, big spaces of sequence or some other property to find interesting outcomes, but you ultimately wanna always test them in the laboratory. So we tested our antibodies with neutralization assays and we tested them in hamsters. So it's no longer algorithmic. The algorithmic helped us get to a point of identifying a good set of candidates or optimizing a pool of billions of, of antibodies, but then we fished fish them out using physical laboratory processes and we tested them with a bunch of collaborators. So a bunch of independent groups all validated our results. Um, and that that's, that is my feeling that algorithms can help optimize your goals, but you always wanna test it in the lab as soon as possible to get down to like grassroots proof. Um, what algorithms can also do is they can give us some guidance over um, how well, well, not exactly algorithms, structural biology can tell us the odds that a new mutation is gonna mess with our antibody. So we know where our antibody binds. If we find new mutations that are far away from it, we'll test them anyway, but it's a pretty safe bet. If they're far away from the binding site, it's less likely that that mutation will interfere with our antibody. So right now our antibody appears to bind a site it's pretty safe from a lot of the known mutations that are occurring. We're testing that to be sure. Like I said, you go away from computational into the wet lab as soon as possible. I'll tell you one thing that algorithms don't do well is try to predict how the virus is going to mutate in the future. Now, this is the reason why the flu vaccine just isn't that effective. And the fundamental problem is that there isn't, like, I think that you cannot create an algorithm to do that. And my reasoning here is that there's something called the Tajima's D statistic. This is a population genetic statistic. And it basically asks the question of, how many ways can something mutate? If a, if a virus could only mutate like one step at a time and it was deterministic, then you could anticipate it. You could design something to protect yourself. But unfortunately, that's not how evolution works. The If you imagine strain A, strain A, um, the RBD is a 224 amino acids. Um, we know that some of those mutations, these amino acids can't change because they're con super conserved, but most of them aren't. And many of them can mutate neut neutral, silently, so a neutral mutation, or they can mutate to cause an advantage to the protein. But because there are uh, hundreds of millions of possible combinations, and even just in the first set of, of single mutants, you have 19 amino acid alternatives at 224 positions. There's just a huge di diaspora of possible ways that things can shift. That's what that the Tajima's D statistic says that there's too much possible future variation for us to be able to provide a prediction of what happens next in a stochastic system. So, so no, we can't do that. I think the approach that I took for my vaccine is not to try to predict the future, but to try to um, use the past evolution to guide us to say, it was like uh, the studies in the UK with the planes that came back. Um, and I think maybe, I can't remember if it was the UK, but it, during World War II, there were these studies of planes that would come back from bombing runs and they have our, our firefights and they would have bullet holes in them. 
And people did a study of a whole bunch of these planes, and they created a, a map of a plane with all the all the spots where all the bullet 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 uh, holes were found. And what you'd see is there are all these bullet holes in the wings from across all the planes. You'd see bullet holes in various locations. You wouldn't find any bullet holes around the cockpit or around the core part of the engine or the back of the, like a spot on the tail. And initially people were like, oh, well, we should put more, more lead padding around the spots where all the bullet holes are. But that's not true. The reason you'd never find bullet holes where the cockpit is is because if, if a bullet hit the cockpit, that plane wasn't coming back. And so that really taught you the most sensitive parts of the plane were the ones where you didn't see the mutations. And, and that's something that we can learn from these systems. And that's something that my, my technology basically lets, lets the, the body sort out for itself. We just go, hey, okay, here's 30 different versions, sort out for yourself, find the spots that don't change. And it, and it stands to reason, if you find all the conserved sites that, are, that cannot change, you're gonna be in a good position to protect yourself against future viruses. Because if they had 100 years and they haven't managed to change those spots, they're gonna to struggle to next, do it in the next 20. Um, there's a couple of few questions. Do you think the therapeutics could benefit patients suffering from long COVID? No, uh, no, unfortunately not. I think long COVID is a different type of disease. So I, th I think the therapeutics can benefit if you give them early, you will not develop long COVID. Long COVID, this is, this is me speculating a little bit and it's emerging as a new class of problems, but what long COVID, this is the process of people having these really long symptoms and they can be pain, body aches, they can also be neurological. Um, people have a variety of psychological issues that appear to look like brain damage. Um, and they have a lot of tissue damage, heart tissue, um, a number of other issues. The emerging body of evidence appears that uh, COVID-19 infection or SARS-CoV-2 infection um, seems like it could be stimulating what looks like a persistent chronic inflammation, similar to sort of chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, and also autoantibodies, so an autoimmune mediated attack on tissues. This, so we know this infects not just the lungs, unlike influenza, but lots of other tissues, including getting into the brain. And so it could be direct damage by the virus, or it could be immune responses against those tissues that last well after the virus is gone. And we don't fully understand the story, but we do know that that is actually, in my mind, I model it more like an autoimmune prolonged problem. You can protect yourself from it by getting a therapy really early, so you don't have the the virus getting all over your body in the first place and causing the in, the, the induction of autoimmunity. That's a, that's a theory of mine, uh, not yet proven out. But once you're past the point of the live infection, an antibody against the virus isn't really going to do you any good. It's too late. You've created that wildfire, of, and, and you're going to have a whole bunch of those long-term problems. I, I would suspect that the best therapies we're going to see for long, long COVID are going to be a mixture of um, uh, medicines from autoimmune they are uh, from autoimmunity, so rheum rheumatoid therapies for immunosuppression, um, and as well as potentially therapies to aid with like essentially like kind of like uh, post-concussive syndrome or, or various methods to deal with what may be um, uh, neurological neurological damage. And again, that's unclear whether that's the virus in the brain or is that is that cytokines and these chronic inflammation that can also cause um, you know cell behavioral changes. And, and that's like, unclear to me. I'm not a neurologist. But but I will say that no, that an antibody therapy isn't going to do you much good if you give it after the virus is gone. Unfortunately, you need different types of therapies than an antibody against the virus. What has been the most challenging thing with working with antibodies and how did you and your team adapt to any issues? The most challenging thing with working to antibodies, let's see, it's not just one thing. I would say there are multiple. I'd say the the challenges are hitting the right epitopes, and I, did, I spent the whole talk talking about that, um, and uh, various tools to invoke the right antibodies against the right epitopes. Um, making the antibodies developable, which is that they're human, they're thermostable, they express well, that basically making them well behaved, because they don't do you much good if they're against a great epitope, but they're, uh, but, but they're a pain to develop as a drug. Um, the, the next ones are just making it fast and efficient and building better libraries so that you have more shots on goal so you can go serve, have multiple molecules to look after. I showed you we picked five to work with and ultimately we chose one that was our favorite. If I just started with one, I would not have had that luxury. Um, the, the other thing, which I mean, it's challenging but fun, is the, the computational analysis is actually pretty powerful for antibodies. We've seen hundreds of millions of examples. We can apply selection pressures to whole libraries. We can heat a library up and see who survives the selection pressure. And so we're starting to learn these sophisticated models, um, giving us a lot of engineering guidance over how to be able to manipulate an antibody to serve various engineering purposes. That, that's going to be continuing into the future. 
uh, and we're, we're continuing to develop on that. But that those are some of the areas of greatest interest. I think the greatest theories of like the things I wish I had would, I wish, you know, we have high throughput sequencing from the genomic sequencing revolution. We have high throughput synthesis from companies like IDT and Twist and so forth. They'll let me print very large numbers of, of pieces of DNA and I can combine them to create libraries. What I would like to have is high throughput function. So to have some sort of mechanistic screen to having 76 billion antibodies and not have to search first for binders and then pick those binders and search for function. I would just like to something where I can take the 76 billion and expose them to a function selection right away. And I think that would be pretty revolutionary. And there, there's lots of efforts in this space, but I think there's there's more innovation that, that is still deserved. About the copies a virus can make inside a host, would you be able to forecast the number? What was the first the first clause? About the copies a virus can make inside a host, would you be able to forecast the number? I mean, it's for, it's forecasted. So the way that they forecast that, is, well, they the way that they assess that is they in the in the mice and in the the ferrets and hamsters and indeed in people. Um, you can go basically perform cal a viremia calculation. So this typically is you take a biospecimen and you then uh, run a plaque assay. So you look at the number of infectious units. In a, in a hamster or a mouse, one of these organisms, you take out their lungs and you blend them and then you take a, a, you know, a known volume from that blend and you go uh, dilute it and figure out how many viral particles there were in, in a dilution series and then you backtrack to the total mass of the, of the lung. You, in a patient, you can't do that because you have to go blend up their lungs and people don't like that. Um, but but you can um, you can make a series of estimates based on viremia in the nasal cavity or, or various swabs, and uh, that can give you those numbers. That's how we know that the the new the new UK strain and the South African strain they appear to be about fifty percent more infectious. And part of it is that we notice there's it seems to be a significant increase in the amount of virus that's being produced um, uh, by an infectious sub infectious subject. So that's why it seems like it's better able to get through masks and so forth. Um, if you're asking me, can I predict for in, in a given subject if that person is going to be viremic or not? No, we don't know why there's such a weird range in uh, in, in penetrance of infectivity and symptoms and so forth. This is definitely an area of active research by hundreds of laboratories around the world. And I think looking back over the next few years, we're going to learn a lot about why there was such this weird range. But I don't know right now. Is it is it genetics? <clears throat> is it uh, immuno conditioning? Is it you know a series of past immune exposures? Is it is it a dose effect that, that if you get a tiny bit of virus and you colonize, then it, its rate of growth versus your your fight by your immune system means that you get some immunity but you don't get sick? Is it whereas a big dose is just too too highly colonized? Your starting point, your your your, your essentially your immune system is having to start with the virus too far ahead in terms of its doubling rate versus yours. Look, we don't know these questions, the answers to these questions yet. I think that was the last question. No one sent in anything after that. Unless anyone else has any more questions, I guess we can wrap up. All right. Well, thank you all. Thanks for your patience with some of the uh, uh, technology issues. That it sounds like it was coming from my, my home office. So sorry about that. And thanks for all joining in. Um, if you have any other questions around the other technologies I talked about, I'm happy to address them. Um, and yeah, thank you to you, Dr. Jacob, and also to Centivax for collaborating with us on this. I hope many of you have um, benefited from this and great discussion. Yeah, thank you um, for all <laughs> for everyone putting up with the technical issues. Um, and yeah, we can't wait to see what more Centivax will come out with in the future. Sounds great. All right. Well, you all stay safe out there and get vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs>